Good morning. I'm Tamara Small, CEO of Nayat Massachusetts. Welcome to today's program. As the commercial real estate industry works to expand diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, some firms have led the way by making DEI a core aspect of how they do business. We are thrilled to be joined today by an exceptional group of diversity, equity, and inclusion experts. As a reminder, everyone today will be muted for our webinar. Please feel free to ask panelists questions using the typed Q&A function, not the chat function. This will ensure that we see your questions. The slides will be distributed to all attendees after the program, and today's program will be recorded. This is the third event on NAOP's critical advocacy for diversity, equity, and inclusion. Thank you to our Gavel members for their support. I'd also like to take a special opportunity to thank all of our spring digital sponsors listed on the slide. Support of our spring sponsors allows NAOP to provide exceptional programming despite the challenges of COVID-19. We're incredibly grateful for your support. If you're not a member, now is a great time to join and support the work NAOP does to help address the unprecedented challenges facing our industry. We are tirelessly advocating to ensure policymakers understand our members' concerns. Join today and take advantage of free and discounted events and courses, exclusive members-only briefings and stakeholder sessions, and special members-only resources to help you navigate the commercial real estate landscape here in Massachusetts. Next, I'd like to highlight a few programs and events coming up. On May 25th, we'll be hosting Alston on the Rise, We'll be hearing about Austin's past, present, and future as it transforms into an innovation hub and a vibrant neighborhood for Boston's young talent. On May 27th, we'll be hosting our first virtual bus tour. This will be focused on the life science sector. We'll be joined by uh, Managing Director at JLL, Bob Coughlin, who's also former head of uh, MassBio. He'll provide an overview of this booming sector, followed by a panel discussion with leading developers in the market today. After the program, attendees will receive in-depth pre-recorded sub-market updates provided by expert brokers, spotlighting exciting life science developments. Sponsorship opportunities for this program are still available. Email Taylor Pedersen to learn more. On June 2nd, from 12 to 1, we'll be hosting our multifamily real estate roundtable. We'll bring together local and national experts for an in-depth conversation on all aspects of multifamily real estate. The discussion will be led by moderator Ted Tai, Managing Director at National Development. Find out how multifamily real estate has fared during the past year and where the industry is heading. Now at Massachusetts University, our educational courses, uh, we have some great courses coming up. On June 4th, we'll be hosting Anatomy of a Commercial Building. And June 24th, we'll be hosting Real Estate Finance Fundamentals. There is some space still available, so please sign up. And finally, on June 16th, we'll be joining other commercial real estate organizations to host the third Commercial Real Estate Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Summit. This year's event will take a deep dive into issues of equity. Uh, all of this information can be found on NAOP's website, and uh, so please check out naopma.org for, for information on these and other upcoming events. Once again, please feel free to ask panelists questions using the Q&A function. I do apologize in advance if we don't get to all of the questions. Should you experience any technical problems, we recommend that you log out and log back in. Taylor Pedersen is also available by email to address any technical issues you may have. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce today's panel. Please welcome Inger Jacobs, Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at JLL, Crystal castile Cromedy, Vice President of Talent, Leadership and Diversity at Heinz, Marty Jones, Principal at MLJ Insights, and of course, our moderator, Linda dorsina Fori, Vice President of Diversity, Inclusion and Community at Suffolk Construction. With that, I will turn it over to Linda. Thank you, Tamara. And thank you everyone, good morning. Um, thank you for inviting me to be here today and to join this incredible um, group um, of panelists. Um, so we're really excited. I wanna thank Taylor and the NAOP team and also the board of directors, you know, for your work in the space of diversity, equity and inclusion. Um, it's, it's really important in terms of how do we lift this issue? So as you all know, you know, research has proven um, over the last several years um, that DNI is critical to the success and profitability of all sectors, right? It increases creativity, productivity, and profitability. DNI goes beyond gender and ethnicities. It's socioeconomic, it's seen and unseen disabilities, it's the LGBTQIA, it's veterans, it's age. Big up to Generation X in the house, right? but it has to be intentional and it starts from the top and it's bigger than a human resource initiative. So um, I wanna speak a little bit, you know, about my company, right? Suffolk Construction, um, where I do work um, currently, but before I do, let me acknowledge my colleague, Katie O'Neill, who is serving on the NAOP's board. 
So thank you, Katie, for being here. You know, we have been on this journey, like many companies, Suffolk has, um, have been working in DNI for a number of years. And but George Floyd's murder elevated the conversation and the needs to address the issue of race at a higher level. Um, and next week is the anniversary. And all of us, um, whatever industry, private, public, um, nonprofit, everyone um, has been leaning into this space. While it's uncomfortable at times, right, it has had a positive impact um, because we know for a long time the issue of race is something that was never really discussed. And at Suffolk, our founder and CEO, John Fish, you know, took the lead in leaning into the conversations on race and racism and how does it show up, not just in our country, but also in companies. And so we partnered with Quan Ferry to facilitate a series of conversations and discussions, not just within the executive leadership, but throughout the company. And through these difficult and uncomfortable conversations, action steps were suggested for all to expand their understanding. We lifted up a three C strategy focused on company, construction industry and community. Under company, it's the level setting, it's the learning, it's their education and training, moving us towards an inclusive leadership model, right? Not just DNI, diversity and inclusion, which sometimes is a compliance, kind of check the box, but more how do we integrate it into all of our systems? As we look at construction industry, you know, for the past eight years, Suffolk has been working and supporting and building the capacity of Black, Latinx, Asian, Native American businesses, businesses owned by women and veterans. You know, how do we make sure we're giving them the training and which we've been doing with Build With Us at Suffolk to understand the nuances when teaming up with the GC? Um, and really, how do we get them to participate in our projects? And we've seen a lot of success growing these businesses, um, these businesses in particular businesses of color so that they are able to participate at the prime level and not just the second, third or fourth tier, but really to build the capacity and really to grow wealth. You know, we are evaluating like many of you, the policies and procedures and practices. So this issue of DNI does not just appear as words or a statement, but how do we embed the lens of DNI into all aspects of the company? This work, has to happen, we know that, in order to create a space and a place where employees, your employees can show up as their whole selves and feel supported, respected and valued. And once you have that formula, no doubt, your business will outperform any monolithic organization. And so this is an amazing, this is a great time that we're talking about this. And NAOP, great job on doing DNI, DEI advance. And how are we talking about this in the commercial real estate? Also, want to recognize your work over the last three years, teaming up with organizations like the Builder, the um, Builders of Color Coalition. You know, how do you make sure that you know folks who are in the industry now has access and opportunity, which is very, very important. And so we have an amazing panel um, with us this morning. No doubt this is gonna go by really fast, I feel that. Um, but I wanna take the time now to introduce each panelist and ask them to talk a little bit about themselves and outline their DNI work. So first, I wanna start with Chris, Crystal Castile Cromedy. Vice President of Talent Leadership Diversity at Heinz. Crystal? Hi, Amanda. Thank you for the intro. I'm really, really happy to be here. Um, I joined Heinz just about a year ago. Um, so it'll be a year next month and have been excited to not just uh, join a company that's got such a legacy of excellence um, and, and looking forward in the industry, uh, but it's a, it's a new industry for me. So I've been able to bring a different perspective. Prior to joining Heinz, I was with BP for about 12 years. Um, part of that role included various leadership roles in HR, including business partnering, a, a chief of staff role, um, and an assignment, a three-year assignment in the UK, which definitely brought in my perspective in the oil and gas industry before I came back to Houston. And so being able to, to bring the likenesses and also the differences um, to an organization um, is amazing. My short time so far, um, I'm very, very, very proud to say that we've got a six point strategy at Heinz that really, really anchors around empathy, education and action. And I can't wait to get into our conversation today so we can talk a little bit more about that. Thank you, Crystal. Look forward to it as well. Now, Ingrid Jacobs, the Global Head of Diversity and Inclusion at JLL. 
Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here with esteemed colleagues. Um, and one of the things I'd like to say is I'm even shorter tenured <laughs> than Crystal. So I have just joined JLL about um, late January. And so I have been really excited to come into an organization that's known um, to be very established in the commercial real estate industry. Um, it's one where for many of you, I'm assuming on the phone, you are well aware of the brand, but it's one of those things where I came into this industry new. I was just recently with an organization called Eaton Vance. I was their vice president, chief diversity officer, and it has been a really exciting time getting ramped up in this this time and this model, given um, what Crystal just said. It's been a tumultuous year a year of learning and a year of progress for a lot of firms and a year of rethinking and regrouping. And what I've really been excited about joining this firm is there's been a lot of progress done prior to my arrival. And I'm looking forward to giving them, you know, the expertise that I can bring to the field to help drive us to even higher levels. So that's where I'm excited to talk amongst my colleagues here and um, have a great conversation. Thank you, Ingrid. And now, good friend, I've known Madi a long time, Madi Jones, the principal of MLJ Insights. Madi. Good, good morning, everybody, and thank you, Linda. Um, it is wonderful to be on this panel with all of you this morning, and I wish you could see everybody in the room, but I know you guys are out there listening uh, for this important conversation. Um, I've been in the real estate industry my entire career uh, in all sectors. I started out as HUD, at HUD and then jumped to Corcoran Jenison Company developing a lot of housing and mixed income housing around the Boston area and in New England, and then took that expertise to mass development, the state's quasi-public economic development authority where I was CEO for six years, working broadly on economic development and, and real estate development. When I left mass development, I began to work more on my own uh, and had an actually incredible 15 months as an interim CEO for a community development corporation, Urban Edge, in Roxbury, Jamaica Plain. Um, and, you know, this came at a time when I think all of us were beginning to realize um, how much we had not talked about race, how much we had not talked about equity, um, and how tied it is to the real estate industry. Um, and it made me think about a story um, when I was first working on the Columbia Point redevelopment many years ago, large public housing project in Boston that was being redeveloped, had the opportunity to meet the city engineer who was involved in the original Columbia Point development back in the 50s. And he actually got to name the streets. He was a history buff and he named the streets of that public housing project after Southern plantations, oh. Mount Vernon, Monticello, Belvoir, um, and at the time, as a child of the South, I thought, well, that's kind of interesting history. But now looking at it in this lens where, you know, in the 70s and 80s, 400 predominantly Black low-income families were literally trapped in Columbia Point where the ambulance and, and fire would not go in without police escorts. And the names were names of places their ancestors had been enslaved. Um, you know, if there had been different people in the city engineering department, there certainly would not have been those names on those streets. And so I think I've come to just an awareness of how pervasive and uh, the little things and the big things add up to um, a real estate industry that has just not been very aware of being inclusive. I certainly saw it as a woman and realized I was in a kind of a literally old boys white network, but didn't really think that much about race, equity and inclusion. So I am trying now to just do whatever I can to raise my voice, add to the conversation and think about ways that individual people like me, I'm not in a big company right now, um, can just add to the efforts to make this industry more inclusive going forward. Thank you, Madi. And you know, thank you for that story and lifting it up, right? Because um, that's what's important. It's recognizing, you know, what's happened in the past. And by the way, Columbia Point became Harbor Point and became a national model, right? And how do you take public housing and redevelop it um, to allow growth and prosperity? But yeah, that, that's something, isn't it? 
But as we look back, this is what, and, and this is what's been amazing in this moment is the awareness that is happening, right? Um, so thank you for being here and for sharing and look forward to more. Um, as I look at and Crystal and Ingrid, you know, as you talk about, if you can talk a little bit in terms of the, the work that's happening within your companies, no doubt as you lift up DE and I, one of the things um, I wanted to just touch base and see, you know, what is the importance of communicating the why, right? Or, you know, how do you use data in really level setting um, to address these issues around diversity, equity, and inclusion? I'm happy to jump in, Ingrid, if you're okay with that. Uh, I think data is everything. Um, so your data has to be clean and credible and trustworthy um, um, first. Second, what is the data telling you? Um, and do you listen to the data? <laughs> and so uh, I think data is, is an important catalyst to show an organization a really reflection of its choices over time. Um, and as they think about uh, building their own talent strategy or their people strategy, um, their diversity, equity, and inclusion strategy, whatever it is, um, the data helps shape that roadmap um, to whether or not we're successful, whether or not we need to course correct um, or other things. And so at Heinz, um, I really, really made it my business to come up with dashboards and really think about the data that matters, not just data for data's sake. But when you get information about turnover or other things, um, you don't just dismiss it as, yeah, we're, you know, we're along the benchmark. Peel back the layers. Uh, where is that retention issue coming from? who is not being talked about when we look at the data? Interrogate it, go further. And then that way your, your eyes wide open making the right types of decisions, leaning into where the gaps are and opportunities are, um, but rely on the data. And so I always start there. So I'm sure Ingrid will have more to share on that, but that's my passion no, think, around a particular point. <laughs> <laughs> definitely a passion of mine too. And I think earlier in my career in this space, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, there were many times where, and, and I have to say this carefully, but where pursuing the data was the exercise in and of itself and the asking for the recuts and the redistributions, but what about this? And, and Crystal, you know, tell me if I'm off base, but sometimes you get in that, the hamster wheel of analysis paralysis to where everyone's like, but wait, show it this way. And, and what if we do it another cut versus moving into, well, what are we going to do about it? Because the sum, no matter how many times you add it up, one plus one, you can change the fractions however you want, but it still equals two. So that's kind of where I like to make sure that leaders, HR partners, and others are very comfortable with understanding what is it actually saying? And then what are we going to then move forward to do or not to do, depending on what it what it's sharing. So I think your points, um, Crystal, are spot on. And I think it's just helping your organization understand what are the things you do need to be investigating, like just as she just mentioned, but also what are the things you need to not necessarily spin yourself into a, a circle of well, one more time, let's check this, let's do this. Um, you do want to have obviously some, some you know, data that's substantial and, and makes sense, but you just can't let it be the overarching driver of everything because the data is important, but it's, it's telling you the story you already know just it's validating it. So lots of times I think it's important that companies um, big and small don't, don't get caught up in that. So I'm a humongous proponent, just like Crystal. I think data is key, um, but asking the right questions to get the different, um, different folks who maybe do the reporting or generate it a certain way, because that's what they've always done. Asking it differently, asking that peel back the onion concept is so essential. Um, so that, that would be, the piece that over the years, I'm sure, like I said, Crystal's probably run into a, hmm, that's interesting, <laughs> you know, and you just kind of go back and, and figure it out. And that's what we do. We try to help support our, our partners in doing that. You're right. I, mean, I think, um, and Linda, to your point, data is the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the cutting edge, um, the competitive edge um, is the insights. Yeah. How do you then interpret the insights of what your data is showing you? And that's what your HR professional and your diversity professionals should be doing for the business. A lot of times I run into things where people or leaders and decision makers had no idea what the impact of certain decisions were or had been over time. Um, and once you show you know, what that data is and, and the insights along with it, um, you see a change um, in thinking, um, rethinking, reimagining um, what things could look like. So hopefully we'll, we'll continue to, to do more of that. Absolutely. And it's so critical. And I'll just 
pop in and say, you know, on the construction side, you know, you know, the makeup, right? Construction, <laughs> majority white males. But when I came in in 2018 at Suffolk, that was one of the big things. It's let's look at the, da the data, create the baseline, you know, for everyone to understand. Cause you're right. Sometimes it's just, you know, the analytics, you know, the data is being, you know, pulled together. However, not everyone's seeing it, right? And for us, you know, looking at the gender piece in particular, you know, we just lifted up the rebuild the ratio, um, looking at increasing in 10 years by 10%, the women representation within our company. We are 28% now, um, and we feel that we can do more. And so that's something we just lifted and we're gonna be looking at it more towards now the ethnic lens as well, right? And so very, very important, happy you all said that. Key, um, take a look at everything and peeling back the, uh, the onions. Um, when we think of equity, um, and Madi, this is you, but really any of you, feel free, because um, this is a free-flowing conversation. You know, equity as the missing piece. You know, what does equity look like, right? Because folks will say equity, equality, you know, inclusion, and is it really the same? So with diversity inclusion, if it's not in the leadership and it's just a name, how do you frame that, Madi? And I know you've been in this work for a while. Well, you know, I, I think for me, um, the word that resonates, two words really are fairness and belonging. Mm -hmm. And how in organizations do you as a leader um, or as a manager, you know, continue to create a culture and an atmosphere of fairness and belonging? Um, you know, one of the things that was so surprising to me in my time at Urban Edge, which was the most diverse work environment I had ever been in my life, um, that when we talked about what was the staff worried about, what was gonna happen, uh, you know, were they worried about a new CEO? And we worked through that. The next most important thing they wanted to talk about was diversity and inclusion. And I had never thought that that issue would have bubbled to the top. So we, you know, we got a facilitator in, we had a couple of small sessions just sitting around the table and talking about how you have you know, uncomfortable or conversations with people, you know, someone who's Dominican as opposed to someone who's Puerto Rican or someone who's black or someone who's white. And, and so there's so many levels of this that, you know, everybody is a little unclear like what to say and how to say it. So I think what we tried to do was just open up the idea that respect for your coworkers is most important and you know, if someone opens up a conversation and someone doesn't feel comfortable saying it, then say you don't feel comfortable and that's okay. So it's just creating that atmosphere that's so important. Thank you, Mari. Crystal, I see you nodding your head. <laughs> <laughs> I know you're gonna jump in, go ahead. <laughs> I mean, we're kindred spirits here. I mean, I, you know, just, I agree. Uh, ultimately, it is about um, a sense of belonging um, and a sense of fairness, uh, many things to me, you know, just anchors back to fairness. Um, but in the DEI um, space, that I for inclusion means everyone. And you cannot have inclusion if some people feel as though DEI is everyone except for me. Um, and so inclusion means, means everyone. I just wanna harp on that a little bit. Um, I also just focus back on the fact that I want everyone to feel like they can be their best at Heinz um, and they could um, be themselves at Heinz. And so that's to me what, what, what it's all about. When I think about equity versus equality though, there is a, a clear distinction for me. Um, some may say, well, isn't it all about equality? Isn't that what we're going for? The E should stand for equality. And one of the first things I did when I joined Heinz nearly a year ago was, was rebrand our focus from DNI to DEI. And that was to emphasize equity. Um, and the notion is, and we're, we're doing more programming around this just to be more clear with our employees and really with the public and what we mean, but equity is about acknowledging that different groups have different barriers that they have and face when it comes to the workplace, whether it's progressing, advancing access to resources, access to leadership or otherwise. Um, and you have to first acknowledge that those barriers actually exist and that those different groups um, need different things in order to be successful. And so building a program around what those things are to help people help themselves um, is really what the, um, the opportunity is at Heinz. And I'm so excited about what that looks like, uh, whether it's you know, adding more ERGs or employer resource groups or other uh, ways in which people connect and speak. Um, leaning into tough conversations, as Marty mentioned, sometimes people aren't, don't know what to say or how to say it. 
we get hung up on terms and sometimes it, it pushes us away like microaggressions may mean one thing to one group, uh, but sounds really aggressive to another group and they're not sure how to even um, express themselves without feeling um, as though they're not saying the right thing. But again, I, I will go back to, to empathy, education and action. Um, if you focus on those three things and the spirit of those three things, you can open the door to having the right conversations. Um, people respecting each other and their differences and leveraging that to drive the business forward. At the end of the day, it is a business imperative. Um, uh, Linda, something that you mentioned before. Um, and that's that's our common goal. So how do we, if we drive the success for the company, ideally we could drive success for ourselves individually. Thank you, said. Well <laughs> <laughs> like, hmm, what does one say after that? Uh, I, you know, I think I agree. Equity is is kind of that um, additional bit of flavor to this whole piece, and a little bit of that it, that data piece that we talked about earlier. Some of that comes from when you start to see, hmm, these things are not um, not just not equal, but when she was saying, just kind of having that sense of understanding, you need to understand what is appropriate for which group. That's a part of that extra level of thinking. That's why the equality just isn't quite enough um, in this kind of a conversation. So I agree uh, with the remarks, Crystal. And I, I love the, the story, Marty, that you were sharing earlier. I, I see a lot of why equity should be brought into these conversations, whether it's you know a part of the brand of what the department is or not the behaviors the practices and protocols we need to be making sure that we're we're thinking about equity and how does it show up and how do we approach the work uh, through that type of a lens but you know inclusion all these these letters mean stuff and and thinking about them instead of just like i mean how many times at least early in my career i would say d and i and people would say what does d n i mean mm. and i would be like it's D and I. And they, I mean, it was just amazing to me how early some folks were on the journey. So my whole point is these letters do mean something. And as we try to drive this work within our firms, it's important for people to actually think about why they're up there, so to speak, on, on the title of the department or whatever, and what it is we're trying to do and drive. And I think sometimes for folks that are newer to this conversation or just not clear, we as, as these offices and the people that do this work have to strive to continually build the awareness and show context and connect the dots for people because there's a lot of times when they'll feel like they think they kind of got it, but then later on you'll say, I'm like, oh, I didn't, I didn't understand that. And, and you know, I, I thought Marty's story earlier on where if you would have had a different group of people in the room originally, there would have been a lot probably more sensitivity to saying, that name probably is, is a really poor choice. Yet this individual was, um, you know, empowered to be able to make that decision, which that's great, but not as an informed decision as it probably could have been. And so I think that sensitivity and um, awareness is just essential. And when I think about equity, those are some of the things that pop into my mind as to how are you looking at what's beyond equal, but what's equitable. I, I'm, I'm always... Uh, intrigued by that concept and trying to take people there. And sometimes it's tough. Uh, I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's tough, but it, uh, it's the work worth doing. It absolutely is. Um, totally agree with you. And in this moment, right? And and as Madi gave that story, that was, what year was that, Madi? That was, man. When it was named in the, in the 1950s. I mean, That's it's right, 1953. Yeah. yeah, it was the development. But now as we fast forward to 2021, and everyone has been awoken, right, to the issue of race, to the issue of inclusion, of equity, and agree with you, Ingrid, that there has to be more in terms of helping, you know, those in our companies or even outside, right, and in terms of how we work together and really connect the dots for people and not leaving anyone behind. So I think you all kind of touched on that is how do we have people feel that they are part of this, right? Like your well-being is my well-being, right? That we have empathy for each other, that we recognize and appreciate differences in the end. That's that's what it's really about. And so I thank you, um, ladies, for that um, wonderful conversation and dialogue. So as we think of you know, the education piece, yes, yeah, very tough in terms of you know the having the conversations, but more importantly, how to, embedding 
you know, the lens of DNI and recruitment and retention. You know, what does successful recruitment and retention look like? And how do you truly build an inclusive culture? Right. I love how Crystal said, you know, you morph from you know, DNI, right? Or Ingrid, DNI, the acronym, right? It's true. Um, from that into DEI. For us, we were with DNI, Sam, right? And then it was more, but you know, that's more compliance a lot of times, right? Checking the box. And for us, we're transitioning from that into an inclusive leadership model. So now moving towards idea framework, which is inclusion, diversity, equity, but accountability, the ownership, right? That it doesn't just stay with the DNI and HR team, but how do we embed it through everything? So I lift that question up in terms of when we look at retention and recruitment, what does that look like? And what does it mean to really create an inclusive culture? But we touched on it a little bit. And then I think we're gonna to move to a fast round because I know we have Q&A, but go ahead. <laughs> Anyone? Okay. I'm happy to start. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's a great topic and, and I've heard, you know, the term lens or DEI lens and it's certainly something we're doing at Heinz and basically I describe it as uh, applying a DEI lens to all of our people practices. That's right. And so that's meant to help drive that sense of accountability, Linda, that you're speaking of. But what does that really look like? What does that mean? And so, um, you, you know, one of the things we, a few things we were able to do is talk about, we talk about um, attraction. Um, it, it, it's attraction, it's recruiting, it's development, it's retention, it's all those things. It's not just in the door. Um, and how do we make sure we're looking at people in, and prioritize movement and progression for people within the organization? And so we know we have kind of a bottleneck when it gets to you know a certain level of leadership among women um, and among um, ethnically diverse people as well. And so what are we doing in order to pause um, and have that right conversation about the entire profile of our organization so we don't get stuck speaking about the same five people when it comes to opportunities. And so that's also where data comes back in um, so that, that Ingrid and I were talking about. Uh, I think the other thing too is, you know, we put a, 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 when it comes to our ERGs or our employee research groups, we um, focus on a concept called the four C's. Um, and that's to help bring that sense of accountability uh, on the employee side as well. So not curating an ERG just as an events type of mechanism, but Focusing on career, community, culture, and commerce, which is the business, having that ROI, that return on that investment for both the business and the employees to uplift and progress members of those particular affinity groups. That's important. Uh, we also um, added a couple of HBCUs, so historically Black um, colleges and universities, that definitely helped um, bring more awareness to the commercial real estate industry to schools that we hadn't gone before and found excellent students um, and excellent graduates that we were able to offer permanent uh, roles for. And so uh, those are just a, a couple of examples of, of what we've done. Um, when you think about talent management and our talent practices and being consistent and fair um, and clear about how people progress, those all have a DEI lens to it. Those, all, those are all opportunities for us to tell people we are doing things in a fair and a transparent way. Um, and so I'm excited about, you know, how we um, advance that and continue the conversation in that space. Yeah, I think, um, you know, one of the things about recruitment is to try to get out of the box of certain credentials being the only thing. Um, you know, and I'll again go back to my experience at Corker Jenison, you know, very entrepreneurial company. Um, and early in my career, uh, they hired a Harvard Business School graduate to be the director of marketing. And he was down on one of the properties one weekend when a homeowner came luring in complaining about things and hid in the closet, right? He didn't have the skills yeah. to wow. deal with. It wasn't his, didn't, anyway. And, and so the company culture actually then it was sort of like, well, that Harvard <laughs> Business School, you know, degree didn't really give the guy the skills we were looking for. And, you know, so I, I, I've personally always been a person that's looking to what the person is about and where they learned what they learned and do they have the skills. And I think too many recruiters and other people get caught up in the, is it an Ivy League school? Is it the credential, is it the degree credential? as opposed to the you know, real world experience credential that can bring people in and have them be just as successful. I love that story. <laughs> That's <happens>. so great. <laughs> I'm just imagining someone trying to fit into a closet and then pretend like they're not there. That, that reminds me of something a young 
a young child would do, but I, I love that story. Um, I would say from a recruitment standpoint, you know, Crystal touched on it earlier, but there's so many more dimensions. I used to, at my desk, have this, that easy button. You remember the, the one you'd press it? Mm-hmm. Because every time someone would come in and say, you know, we've got to get to these historically Black colleges and find this talent. And I would say, you know, it, it's, it's beyond the early career piece. It's beyond getting that talent in the door. It is absolutely incumbent on you. You have elements of diversity within the four walls right now what are we doing to ensure that these people feel seen, heard, valued, and there's a path forward for them that is meaningful in a way that they want to drive success and it aligns with the business. And it's not just promoting people for promotion's sake or because they are one dimension of diversity or another. It is ensuring that they have a fair shot to the same opportunities as others. And at any rate, it it just, it's interesting to me when I think about the in a, a large portion of, of corporations' budgets lean into the early career piece. And I get it because it's, it's kind of a big machine and there's it's definitely where we want that young talent to come from. But in several corporations, the, the at the top, this tends to be where you, where you are challenged a little bit more as far as finding that talent um, that has dimensions of diversity, ethnicity, um, different uh, veteran status, all these different elements, that's where sometimes it gets a little bit of a struggle to be able to find that talent there. So sometimes I like to encourage organizations, the ones that I've been in the past, to not not necessarily pull away from early career you know, path as well as getting that talent in the door, but also never to take your mind off the fact that you need to be thinking about that from the, the junior executive, you know, mid mid-manager, junior executive type range as well. So you could be feeding that pipeline, not just from the beginning, but also in the middle and, and, and towards the end, towards that leadership role. So it, it's it's a multifaceted, multidimensional um, challenge, one in which you have to think a little bit beyond that, that, hey, let's hit the button and let's go to the campus where we're an unknown entity and we're going to show up and expect them to hand over their best and brightest to us when we've done none of the investment, not just financial, but the time um, the trust building that's necessary for a dean or a professor to say that that's a company you want to go work for. They they've got good. They treat people well. That comes with time, and sometimes corporations will come in and just assume I plunk down. My brand's well known. These young people will be beating a door to my path, and sometimes that's the case. Some brands we all could think of five to ten brands that we know that is no matter what they do, <laughs> there's going to be tons of talent running in there. But for a lot of our corporations, we may be an industry that isn't well known to you know, other demographics, and we may be a group of, that is, doesn't have the strongest brand out there. So it's, it's incumbent upon us to do a little bit of that homework on the front end to build recognition with those groups. But also, like I said, in that, that middle tier, it doesn't take away the fact that we've got to do that um, higher up through the hierarchy in, in firms too. I agree. I mean, I think you know, the whole HBCU focus um, it's not a novel idea. Um, a lot of companies do that, whether you're in the commercial real estate industry or not, whether you're trying to break into um, some type of relationship with campuses or not. I mean, I think my, my view is um, if you haven't tried it, then don't knock it. So let's try it and see what works. Uh, but, but specifically for the commercial real estate industry, um, we don't have a lot of people um, through dimensions of diversity, as you call it, Ingrid, that are, um, that are um, aware of the industry and what it can um, generate or provide for them as a career option. So to me, our first priority has to be introducing people to the industry before introducing them to our company. And so that's kind of the greater good, you know, from a commercial real estate perspective. Uh, if you end up at JLL or somewhere else, fantastic for you, as long as we're bringing more awareness um, to, to attract excellence um, into the industry and, and it will pay its way forward sometime around, um, you know, when it comes to time and what people are interested in. Um, the other thing, too, just you just made me think about uh, one of the other things that's different um, from a, a Heinz versus like a BP or a big organization is leveraging the nimbleness of the size and scope um, and reach of a company the size of Heinz, which is just around 4,800 employees, which is, um, you know, larger organizations tend to do, you know, big bang type of programming. If it's not big, we're not doing it. Uh, but, you know, you can be very nimble and, and have those grassroots relationships that you're cultivating and curating for years 
to help impact how we're um, bringing more awareness to um, to the industry. And it's something that we're doing. And I always tell people we should ne never, ever lose that. Don't stop the grassroots, deepen the grassroots as much as we can, because um, it's going to pay its way forward. And, and like I said, it's going to be good for the overall industry. That's wonderful. Um, totally agree um, with everything, right? And, and the awareness is, is the most important and really letting people know that your industry, commercial real estate, or for us construction, people still think of it as hammer and nails, right? Yes, we are that because we are builders, but it's more, it's technology, it's innovation, um, it's 3D modeling, 4D, and, and it's quite amazing how we've come a long way and, and it's how do you recruit people and get them enticed in it. So as we think of NAOP and the amazing work that they've been doing on behalf of the commercial real estate industry in terms of advocacy and policies, not just not just in the state, but also federally, you know, how do we use our influence as an industry, you know, to support policies of change? Um, I, I look at Marty, because I know Marty um, was in government like me. So I'm a former um, state senator and state rep here in Massachusetts. I've worked in this space for a while. So Marty, what do you think? And then- I, mean, I, I, think, I think leading by example is really at this point, the best way, yeah. um, you know, and NAOP does have a great partnership with uh, Builders of Color, which if yeah. people don't know about that organization, um, it would be great to check it out. You know, it's a Boston based uh, network of over 500, I think, uh, real estate professionals of color in all kinds of different industries. Um, so I think that that's, that's something that people really need to do and lead by example. I think I've been thinking a lot about what an individual can do um, and what individuals who are maybe not in leadership um, and trying to find ways to, um, I think, be intentional, uh, try to build your networks. You know, if you're looking for, uh, you know, you know you're going to need a civil engineer at some point. Uh, try to find one now. Don't wait till that RFP is due and then, you know, go scurrying around to find somebody. You got to build a relationship. And uh, again, other organizations like Amplify Latinx and the Mass Minority Contractors Association, they're out there and they're resources uh, for, for people to help, you know, build their networks and try to find ways to, to be more inclusive. So I think I think the real estate industry just needs to start doing the work. Um, you know, government is government didn't help create this problem. Government's not going to solve this problem. Um, we've got to all do it ourselves. Um, certainly, some government programs, like some of the things Massport has done to require certain percentages of equity ownership, help, and those are good policies that can happen. But I think there's a lot of work the industry can do um, on its own. Absolutely. And I'll just lift up and say for all of you who are listening, get to know your state reps and your state senators, right, in the neighborhoods and districts where you live, very important. So as we talk about the Massport model, um, I just want to highlight that it took legislation to make that happen, right? And I used to be the state senator for the first Suffolk where I had South Boston, you know, the waterfront, right, the biggest development. And we were looking at the billion dollar convention expansion. And so we embedded language around access and opportunity, right, that looked at not just the boots on the ground, but what are we doing with businesses that are joining in the construction of, you know, for instance, the headquarters hotel, right, and Massport took that and ran with it and made it huge, which is wonderful, and a focus on equity and inclusion and really diversity. So I say this to all of you, your legislators, your elected officials, hold them accountable, right? I know this is being recorded. It's okay to my colleagues. Call <laughs> them and let them know, you know, you could do more and there's more that could be done, which is really important. But thank you, Madi. Um, I'll say really quick, as I look at Ingrid and I think of, you know, JLL being a global company, right? What does that mean in terms of DNI? Obviously, DEI here in the United States, it's, 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 yes, we know it's more, we talked about the different groups, obviously, but in this moment, we're talking, we were focusing on race in particular. But as we think of globally, you know, how does that show up, right? In terms of the culture of inclusion, and what does that mean, you know, on that, in, in on that level? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it's humbling when I engage with people across the globe, I'm constantly reminded of all the different ways these concepts resonate and even the language, what you call people of color in certain mm -hmm. parts of the world, that's considered offensive uh, to address someone in that, that way. So just 
being able for me kind of to switch my mindset, depending on where I'm, I'm landed um, or wh- whom I'm talking to on my Zoom call, it's always this sense of understanding what am I trying to drive across the enterprise from a global standpoint? Like what are those non-negotiable things that we all need to be working on to drive us um, to execute the diversity and inclusion strategy, but also to help um, drive us to success and, and meaningful collective impact of change. And then there's also this sense of how do I also be respectful of what's going on in that local region so that they feel, not just perceive, but actually feel and see different ways that this strategy materializes in their local environment. And that to me is a huge part of what, uh, what I try to do and try to balance regularly. But the global nature of this work simply is understanding the um, kind of the rules of engagement in that local market and understanding and partnering with those people that deal with it on a daily basis and trusting them to be able to educate me to make sure that I am not necessarily forgetting about that and trying to do the things that are going to resonate most. But there's certain concepts, like the concept of belonging, um, that feeling that you know when you do belong. Those are elements that no matter where you are in the globe, love, trust, sadness, the, like those core elements of humanity, typically, you know, there's a word for it in just about every language. And so those are the key things that I try to talk about and that I, I'm not naive, <laughs> I recognize. Uh, love, trust, like all vulnerability, all these different things are not things that typically corporations are, are saying regularly. So concepts wise, it's it's a new muscle that we're working on. And, and I'm very happy and proud that JLL has been in this space of diversity, inclusion, and talking about equity and belonging for a while. So it's not like I showed up and they suddenly realized that, apologies for that background noise, home phone. Um, but one of the things I think is important for us to really recognize and understand is we have to put that global lens on the front end of things, not on the back end after uh, something's built from the US or the Americas and then we send it out globally. I have to hold myself accountable to ensure, am I hearing all voices? Have I reached out to a different region um, and talk to them and make sure I socialize this to ensure on the front end of the creative process, they're included and they feel like when they see what is rolled out eventually from a global standpoint, it feels like, they had input, meaningful input. So that's that's a part of how I uh, work with this global nature. Now, it isn't always perfect, but we definitely try our best to uh, to make sure we are listening um, as we go apart and, and talk to the different groups around the globe. That's wonderful. Thank you. So this has been um, quite fascinating. I just have to say that great conversation. The um, Q&A box is a lot of questions are coming in. So <clears throat> gonna pivot now to the Q&A and then feel free um, to jump in, okay? I know we have about 15 more minutes left, but would love to try to get to as many questions as I can, though all of them may not be answered. I just put that out there um, for everyone. As, as um, here's a question. As the need for DEI models increase, um, mind you, these are in tiny prints. How do we address or educate company leaders who are resistant to change or evolving? So as the need for DEI models increase, how do we address or educate company leaders who may be resistant to change or evolving? Hey, Linda, I'm happy to jump in on that one. Um, I mean, I used the term before about um, it being a business imperative. Um, the, the conversation has to be, um, you know, it's, it's the morally right thing to do and it's a business imperative. And so, um, and sometimes we just have to change up the language um, that we use in, in order to help, um, you know, people who may be resistant or not see the clarity, um, you know, um, in terms of business generation or business loss, or here's some opportunities that could, there's a cost um, that could come to you. Um, if you're not um, demonstrating that, your workforce reflects the communities um, and other areas in which you are trying to affect and also trying to improve in this built environment business that we're in. And, um, you know, one example would be about supplier diversity. So we, I'm sure all of you have experience working, um, you know, populating RFPs or completing RFPs uh, or, or um, due diligence questionnaires where these companies um, are very, very interested <laughs> in seeing uh, what is our policy practices and other things in the DEI space. Uh, and I'm sure that some companies have lost business based on how they may or may not have responded to those questions. 
Um, what does your public corporate website look like when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion? Can you attract the talent that you need, whether it's early experience or experienced hires? Can they see themselves in your leadership team? Uh, do they feel like they would have a sense of belonging, that they would have a fair shot at progressing where they want to? And so I think switching the language uh, coupled by data and insights to help show some proof points about not just opportunities, but opportunity costs. Um, when you when you don't act versus doing something more progressive. Yeah, I think that that's a great point about it's not just governments that are looking for this in, you know, who they hire, uh, a lot of educational institutions, a lot of other companies that are hiring real estate professionals to do business with are asking these questions. And, you know, it's becoming more and more of a way to show that you're, uh, you know, a progressive company to to be intentional. I think it's also important, and I know this is hard as an employee, but to let leadership know that it matters to you um, and hopefully find other colleagues inside your company that, you know, are willing to talk to their supervisors and let people know it's important to you and that you're willing to help the company make some changes um, and to be to be more inclusive. So I think some of that has to has to help, especially in smaller companies. Um, you know, for people to really hear it. That's great. So as you, as you said, as we touched on this question, I'm going to pivot. There's another question that kind of touches on that, right? That in terms of, can you comment on professional and appropriate ways to turn on the light, right? For people who have unconscious bias, you know, this person, especially it says that, especially when I see it and feel it or experience their bias, you know, do you have a best practice, right? Or suggestion, love the idea of, you know, saying it and, and putting, putting voice to it. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll start off just mm -hmm. um, in general, there's, there's a lot wrapped up in that, um, yes. you know, each person comes in with their own triggers and, and touch points and history sure. that leads them to every moment meaning what may land one way on me today, tomorrow may be completely irrelevant and I'm oblivious to it. And so I always tell people, you know, you're dealing with humans. I love them, but they're irrational beings. And so sometimes things happen, but it doesn't mean bias is not real. And it doesn't mean things like microaggressions don't happen. It just also means that there's an education process for both the person who is feeling like this is happening to them and education also for the person who may be the one doing it uh, because there has to be a sense of a both as opposed to this person's bad because they committed this we're all human we do it to each other all the time so even as you know i, I identify in many different ways heterosexual able-bodied um, a mother all these different categories there may be days when i say something inadvertently that maybe is offensive to uh, a single dad who's gay i i may say something where in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, it's no big deal. But this person is like, no, that's, that's mm -mm, cross the line. I'm my, it doesn't matter what my intent was. If my impact landed, then that's something I have to own. But my point is, I, sometimes I feel like, I don't want to say the word demonization, but there's definitely this vilification kind of a mindset of when people um, make an error or, or um, have a misjudgment in what they may have said or behavior they may have done. It's certainly not someone who, I'm, I'm not talking about someone who's like a card carrying, like habitual, like that's, that's not it. I'm just saying there's a lot of grace in this work. And sometimes I think it's just easy to forget that. And I think, especially in this last year, mm. things have really been very heightened and there's a lot more people kind of like on edge. I mean, we've been sequestered in our homes for a year, for goodness sake. People are a little edgy. But at the end of the day, you know, bias is real. It happens and it's a part of what we have to deal with. But I, I really like to remember that I'm fallible. Everyone is. And it's important for us to remember if you lean into it, if you build relationship with other people and you say, you know, I, I'm sorry, that was not my intent. What can I learn to do better, do more? And you, you come at it with that. Um, I, I think that's a part of the elements. It's not a full solution, but it's a part of the humanity of this work that we try to do. And like I said, I, I would love to defer to the others to, to share their tips and tricks or thoughts on this too. Yeah, sure, I'd love to jump in on that. Um, I think you're right. I, I, I do think it's, it comes from a place, you start from a place of heart. What is your intent? Um, and, and to be fair, bias is, all bias is not unconscious, <laughs> okay? So let's just be you know clear about that. And the sooner we can be honest, 
with people, the sooner we can get to a place of better understanding, empathy, and, and action around the right things. Uh, I mean, what I've found is most people want to know, you know, when they may be saying something offensive or thinking something different or, and, and may, may have been oblivious, but, but now is the time to make sure we're leveraging the momentum um, that has been built. Uh, and for some people, uh, you know, the things that have been happening in, in society and in the world have been happening forever. But now there's a heightened awareness, so we should take advantage of it. I do think, um, you know, a lot of companies focus on bias awareness training. We've certainly put some um, bias awareness training um, at Heinz. We've made it a goal to, to, you know, to make sure we have a certain percentage of people uh, who would have taken that training. But coming out from different angles um, and recognizing, Ingrid, to your point, we all have them. They all show up in different ways. Um, but at the end of the day, to me, if we're really going to push things, it's about creating a speak up culture. Their culture has to has to recognize um, and encourage uh, people speaking up. But what that means is though, is it's recognizing we all come from different levels of courage <laughs> to do that. Um, sometimes as HR professionals, we're a bit leaned on to speak up for others when they don't have the courage or the comfort in order to do that. But the companies adding that speak up culture, whether it's compliance, whether it's do the right thing, whether it's safety or whatever the, the topic is, um, that's where you can, you know, challenge people where everyone is responsible for it, not just one person, one level of leadership or a type of um, employee. Well said, everyone. I mean, really, because it is allowing the space and the place, you know, for people to, you know, show up, right, as who they are, but more importantly, recognizing themselves and others. And it is going to take time. It does take courage of being uncomfortable. And, and really leaning into the moment. Um, I wanna thank you all um, for this amazing um, conversation. I'm gonna say, Nayab, we gotta do this again because this was awesome. Um, there's a lot more questions I know, but we can't get to it all. But I just wanna thank you, you know, Crystal, Ingrid, Marty, um, for, for your work in lifting it up and being present and really helping to change the dynamics, right? In commercial real estate, yes, but really not just internally and professionally, but, but also personally, right? In our communities um, and where we live and where we're working and growing our families. And, and wanna thank NAOP again um, for their amazing work with the commercial real estate and the DEI collaborative that you all have put together, really holding each other accountable and looking at the makeup. Data is important. We learned that today. So please go back and you know, create the baseline on your op in, in, your, in your companies. Thank you, Tamara. Thank you all. And now I'm going to pass it to you. Thank you, Linda. And thank you to this outstanding group of experts we had today. So many good takeaways. We are going to be providing a recording of today's program uh, for free to those who are interested in reviewing it because there are so many great lessons and takeaways that we do want to share uh, with the industry. So we want to thank you and also to encourage you to check out in the chat, there is a link to the upcoming DEI Summit for Commercial Real Estate. It will be again on June 16th. Registration is open, so please register today. Uh, we look forward to seeing you then. And again, thank you. Have a great day. Take care. This is awesome. Thank you, everyone. And to Madi, I just want to say for Madi, Madi just shared, right? How do you take action? We talked about Harbor Point or Columbia Point. The names, you know, the streets were renamed as part of the redevelopment with the input of the public um, housing residents. So that's how it happens. Action, working with people, bringing people to the table, but more importantly, listening to their voices. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.